Hi, Working Preachers. This is Caroline Lewis. I just wanted to remind you that the Working Preacher Spring Campaign is ending in a few days, but you still have time to make an impact for millions of preachers. Working Preacher needs your help to continue providing resources to our church leaders all over the world. Go to workingpreacher.org to make your gift and unlock additional content of the Sermon Brainwave team from last week's Festival of Homiletics. Also, if you make a gift before the campaign ends on May 31st, your gift will be matched dollar for dollar up to $10,000. Thank you for supporting this vital work. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And to me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for Holy Trinity Sunday, which falls on June 4, 2023, are Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 4a, Psalm 8. The second reading is 2 Corinthians 13, 11 through 13, and Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Happy Holy Trinity Sunday to all. And also with you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, Trinity Sunday. We we all I mean, I always kind of talk about this is a hard Sunday if your if your ambition is to explain the Trinity to people. So make sure that's not your ambition or your goal. And, and rather drag people into the mystery that in some ways is provoked by last week, Pentecost, mm -hmm. where as you know, as the church year maps this story onto the year, now we've you know, had Jesus come and go and uh, promise to send a helper or to send the power of God and the Holy Spirit. And, that's kind of, and so now the question is, well, what do we do with all this? <laughs> but the thing is, you know, it's, it's, I think the texts actually help us with this as well. These are not passages meant to help you say, aha, look at that. The early church confessed the Trinity as much as there are texts that say, when we talk about God among us, it becomes Trinitarian. Or when we talk about the Trinity, we recognize that that is our, our encounters with the Trinity are very much human encounters that happen in the course of our human existence, our interaction with creation, our experience with Jesus, uh, living, crucified and risen, our experiences with the spirit. And so it's also a, it's a Sunday about human experience or about religious experience and about a God who is willing, indeed eager to be known in the everyday stuff of our lives with all the requisite mystery and transcendence, you know, but this is a, it's a Sunday about us <laughs> insofar as a story about human experience and what does it mean to search for God and to be encountered by God? I, that's at least where I'm going. That's where I'm staking my flag this year. Yeah. I think I'm uh, in a similar place, Matt, in that when I was looking at the text this year, and as you said, the way in which the early church is drawing on an experience, the experiences of God that then help them think about how God works in the world and what God is up to. And that's in these, you know, trin we call them Trinitarian formulas now, but it's, it's, it's really how is it that we know God and how is it that God is revealed? And then also what what difference that makes. I think that's kind of where I landed that, uh, that like, for example, for the Matthew text that connected to the Trinity or the Trinity is connected to mission, uh, the, that, which is so important for Matthew, uh, and that in Genesis, you have this sense of that, that the Trinity is about creation, right? That, that, Cre the creative activity of God is known in these three ways. And then in the Corinthians text, grace, uh, what is it? Grace, love, and communion. And so that's kind of, that's the direction that I went, that the, that the Trinity is not just a, not just a knowing of God, but like, what difference does that make? It, it calls out, it, it moves us into the world. It, it, 
uh, it reinforces God's creative activity. It, uh, it gives some definition to how we experience God. So something along those lines that I think is maybe helpful when we try to pre- preach the Trinity. <laughs> I appreciate beginning with this as we have this as the named day. Uh, uh, Matt, as as you opened us, I, I appreciate Joe Green's um, uh, opening to his commentary on, on Corinthians where he says this wasn't what the writings um, of the epistle or any of the other texts were not the concerns of the third and fourth century, um, you know, uh, early writers, uh, uh, interpreters of the faith. And so um, I lean into this day uh, in the idea of if God allows us to express our experience of God, or I think you use the word, Matt, encounter of God, and then we name God as we have experienced God. We have experienced God as creator over and over and over again. God showing up in in chaos and there is beauty. We've experienced God as the one who empowers us when we are at our weakest, when we are at our greatest longing, when we are at the moment when we just think we can't go on or we don't know how to go on. God pushes us. God pulls us, God envelops us that we might go into this mission, which has been God's all along. And so it it just seems to me that each one of these is a naming of God. And if we turn back to, uh, since we've talked about all the text in in some way or another, Caroline, you kind of walked us through uh, that and I'm following your lead. Um, Psalm 8 reminds us that we are acknowledged by God, but it also reminds us to that fullness of creation that we bear the image of God. And for me, that circles us all the way back. If God is acting in the world, then God's spirit upon us sends us out into God's mission. And so we act in the world, which I hope brings us back to Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. And, but let me kind of say one thing to piggyback on on what you're saying there, Joy, too. I mean, all of these texts have some kind of language about that, whether it's to be made in the divine image or to be crowned with glory and honor in Psalm 8, uh, to bear the name of Jesus, to be baptized of of the Trinity in, in, in Matthew 28, to be given divine authority from Jesus. And, and in second Corinthians, the way that that benediction works, right? What is it pronouncing upon the people? That's already true. That's already there. But the 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 pronounce the pronouncement is in a way an acknowledgement and a way of kind of enacting what's already there. Yeah. So you want to go to Matthew? Well, yeah. I I, I said this already earlier that the way in which the way in which the Trinity is invoked, or you know that 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 there is no sense of of mission in the world or no, there's no uh, there's no capacity for uh what being sent you know what being sent means and looks like without a recognition of of God Jesus and the Holy Spirit present and so it makes it puts a little bit of I don't know, maybe some sort of like particularity when we think about going and being sent and baptizing and te- and teaching to obey everything I've commanded you, uh, commanded you that it puts some sort of, you know, what are we doing in these sent places? What are we, mm. what are, how are we embodying God? How are we, how are we embodying Jesus? How are we embodying the spirit? And so it, I think it gives a kind of, uh, intimates a kind of breadth of our of our sentness if you will that uh but can't all also can't encompass right what it what it means to be sent into the world to to announce the kingdom of god um so it's i don't know and maybe it invites people to think about uh when they when they talk about god or when they give witness or testimony to faith on what part of the Trinity do they rely the most? I mean, mm. where is it that they find, where is it that they locate their theological imagination? And maybe there's a challenge in that too, to say, well, if it's always about Jesus, uh, maybe Trinity Sunday is a moment to say, 
yeah, but what about God and what about the Holy Spirit? Uh, where does that fit into your, you know, your theological imagination? I love that. I appreciate that um, because we do. Um, we we can get in this uh, sense of Jesus as if Jesus isn't the fulfillment of the faithful promise of God, and and as if what Jesus has done in leaving us a comforter is not a continuation of the faithful fulfillment of the promises of God. Uh, so I appreciate that. I I looked at uh, the text and picked up on uh, verse 17, uh, where it says, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And it, it seems particularly, uh, if I could say in this day and age, which I mean, any day and age, that there will always be doubt. There will always be a challenge to our confidence in the faithfulness of God. Hope you saw what I did there. Um, there will always be a challenge for us in that. But the promise is that God is with us. That that Emmanuel from the very beginning, um, from the very, very beginning, in the beginning, God is with us even until the end of this age and all the ages to come. So it's a recognition of our reality. Sometimes I don't know what to do. Sometimes I don't know how to hold on to hope. And the recognition of the promise that we can hold to. God is with us. Sometimes God is with us as the one who creates out of chaos. Sometimes God is the one who sustains us. Sometimes God is the one who teaches us. Sometimes God is the one who redeems us, who calls us, who seeks us, who shows up. However you experience God, God is with us. And that seems to be a promise that we might need to hold on to right now. Okay. I could say more. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know how much we want to stick on Matthew or, or move on. Yeah, we can thing. move on. There's one thing I wanted to say too, when you were talking, Joy, I, I just, a, it's an obvious statement, but just the reminder of the, the way in which Matthew brackets the gospel of that God with us. And mm -hmm. so that ex, that experience of, you know, Emmanuel, God with us in chapter one, and now the presence of Jesus, God with us, now, because of because of the story of Jesus, now that God with us takes on a different understanding or a different breadth and depth, uh, and then you add the Spirit into that. So I think you know it. it I think that's an important uh, uh, theological theme, of course, in Matthew. I think the other the, one other thing I was uh, checking the Greek on the. Matthew 28, lo, you know, and lo, well, lo, I am with you. Remember, whatever. I am with you always to the end of the age. And the end is translated, uh, it's translated end, but it can be, it also can, can be translated consummation or completion or perfection. And so it's not, I think that helps me too with the concept of the Trinity. It's not like the end, end as an eternal, but like, uh, the end as God imagines of the consummation of God's revelation. And so that, you know, that the Trinity is, is even, even the Trinity is uh, not in, can't, can't fully <laughs> help us think about what God is up to and what God is doing. And so there's still, there's still that consummation that, you know, that perfection yet to come. Uh, that only that is only known by God. So, okay, now we can go that's, on. That's it. Well, that's part of the two sides, right? Is that there is this kind of inexhaustible mystery that's wrapped up in this, but at the same time, the church also bears the name of Father, Son, and Spirit, and mm -hmm. so the, yeah. the church is this manifestation. Yeah, I should say, you know, God's people are still that manifestation of who God is um, in flesh, right? So there's this interesting pairing of uh, transcendence, eminence. Yeah. Yeah. But speaking of transcendence, Genesis, Genesis one, take it. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I assume this text is assigned to kind of link the Trinity to God's creative activity. It might be as simple as where God uses first person plural, you know, this, this let us, which I don't think is necessarily a quote unquote proof for the Trinity, 
But it's interesting that that puddle does show up when it's time to make humanity. And so when we are talking about being made in the in the divine image, first of all, I think as I as I have read and studied Genesis one that the image of God there is in God's creation of male and female. There's not the ordering of creation um, that we see in Genesis two, for example, and how this means for what it means to be human, how we think about gender is another question, but it's when God starts asking, you know, let us make humankind in our image, that there is a complexity to that. Um, and it also means that something about humanity reveals the Trinity, right? That there is a humanity of God. There's something in the capacity of what it means to be human that somehow reflects all the mystery and the complexity of what in the world God is in God's fullness. Which is important, you know, that where do you go to learn about the Trinity? You don't just go to a, a grand cathedral. You don't just sing uh, your, your favorite Trinity hymns and all of these kind of majestic transcendent things. Uh, you also find it in the things that human beings do in terms of creating, in terms of loving, in terms of suffering and so on. A, a powerful image for um, what we do with the whole of, of the story from creation to new creation to begin in the beginning, God. So we talked about when, when we were talking about this as Trinity Sunday, that this is ultimately all about who God is. And we'll have more to say about that in, in the weeks to come, but um, to that we begin this story with a God who is creating. And um, this isn't a scientific proof text. Um, in fact, uh, I, I, I would say this isn't the text that um, uh, reads that God created out of nothing because it literally does read that in the beginning there was this chaos. I believe, let me say, there are other texts that confirm that nothing was made without him, that God created all that is and that Jesus was a part of that. Um, and, and so there are other places to get the God is responsible for everything, um, but not necessarily this text. This text, I think, is giving us something even more um, transcendent, I think was the word that you used to transition us to this text. And um, what, what it does, in a sense, is to help us realize if what God is doing is creating, and I like making beauty out of chaos, then that is what we are to do in the image of God. So that the chaos we find ourselves in, the brokenness that we find ourselves in, Matt, you just mentioned that even in our suffering, that when we bear the image of God, when we are empowered by the Spirit, when we live like Jesus, then there will be beauty out of the ashes, to use another text. There will become what is hopeful, what is new life, what is an opportunity, which is what God keeps doing over and over again. This is the beginning story of a God who is creating with great promise. The story immediately turns that humanity walks out of that promise and God doesn't give up on this promise. God doesn't give up on this creation project. And when we bear the image of God, like God, we are creating, we are bringing life we are fulfilling, bringing beauty out of the struggle. I think too, with the creation story, what I find, I mean, I, I love that, that it, let us make humankind in our image. And I think that first person plural, Matt, that you talked about is so, uh, so important is how we started out the podcast that the Trinity is not just about God, it's about us uh, as well. And, and how is it that we are a reflection of that Trinitarian reality? And then, as you said, uh, as you said, Joy, how is it that, how is it that, you know, bearing God's image is this, is this insistence on creation and creative activity? And I think the other thing I would just add to that is that how, how the sixth day, right, in creation, in the creation story is the longest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and how interconnected we are with all of God's creation. And so that's another way to imagine, I think, the expression of God as Trinity is that this, that it, 
that God's creative activity is so, of course, interconnected with the cosmos, right? And um, and how we are as well. And so, uh, and so, if we think about the Trinity as relationship, you know, it, it, that inherent to God is relationship. That that relationship is not just with other human beings. That relationship is with the created order and the world and the cosmos and all the creeping things. And, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you had to bring that in. I have I issues know. with the creepy things. I know the creeping things. I, I, I don't like to think about the creeping things, but, but you know, that the six, in other words, also the sixth day is not just reserved for us. You know, God was making creeping things and cows and then went to us. So there's, there's, we want to say that we're, you know, um, we're at the top of the <laughs> top of the hierarchical reality, but, but the rea- but the thing is we don't even get our own day. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, we, we have a deep relationship with all the creeping things, but that's, but I think that's a, that's another aspect. I think when we think about the, uh, the the Trinity that would be something one could explore homiletically. Should we go to Psalm eight? I I think it. I would use this liturgically. I mean, I yeah. say you know every <laughs> time, but uh, but I think you know the the way in which it it's the majest yeah how majestic is your name. And if you think of that through the lens of the Trinity, how majestic is your name as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or how majestic is your name as Creator, uh, Creator, Savior, and Sustainer? Uh, you know how how is it that you you know translate, if you will, the the Godhead in the three persons of the Trinity? That that is the name of God, you know, um, and and the way in which. God embodies all of those names is a reality of the Trinity that one could one could direct attention. I think each of the things that we've talked about as we were talking about both the recognition of Trinity Sunday and also about uh, the reading uh, from Matthew, all of that can be uh, lent, uh, and, and as well as, as as the reading from Genesis, all of that can be lent to a homiletical move in 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 Psalm eight around what you were just saying, um, uh, Caroline. That this is about the majesty of the name of God, and it moves to, um, you know, that 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 God is mindful uh, of 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 you know all of the cosmos, um, uh, you know, the moon and the stars. Um, but that also God is mindful of us. And so from the very beginning, it's about God, it's about us. And so I think all of the homiletical moves that we've already talked about are present in this text as well, if that's the way we're leaning into um, uh, what do we want to communicate about the majesty of God? Or maybe I should have said it, what do we want to communicate about the majesty of God in whose image we are created? All right. Second, anything, Matt, Matt? Or Second Corinthians? You all said everything I wanted to say, so we're oh. good. All right. So I'm going to do a word thingy again. Um, not a Greek wordy wordy thing. Um, I'm just a preacher, not a New Testament scholar like you guys are. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, the the same kind of sense that I did with Matthew, where I saw the peace, uh, uh, where I saw the doubt in the present. Um, here it it begins with uh, this um, uh, greet one another uh, uh, agree with one another live in peace, and that suggests to me that there was a lack of peace, um, and I don't know if that's an echo of the creation from chaos, but or if it was just a reality of the world we currently live in where there seems to be such a need for peace, such a need for beauty, such a need for calm. Um, and so this this live in peace um, becomes a bit of a promise, um, a suggestion of knowing the reality that we currently live in, which is a reality that lacks the peace that has been promised. And yet, what the promise is, according to this letter, looks like community. As as one of one of my students uh, uh, just uh, preached. It looks like koinonia. 
And uh, so how, what does that koinonia look like? It, it looks like living together in peace. It looks like agreeing with one another. It looks like order. Um, and as uh, Joe Green does in the comments commentary, it's being restored. It's encouraging one another. It is rejoicing. Uh, so. Yeah. And I, that, again, that connection, how each of the texts reveals something about what the nature of God is and, and, and the nature of God's community and peace where you landed joy. I think when, whenever I, find or whenever in a passage we have a liturgical element uh in my tradition this is the this is the greeting right this is this is typically at the beginning of the service the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the communion of the holy spirit be with you all that could be another direction that a sermon could take really maybe very different from uh, from what we've talked about, but that, uh, you know, when we make, when, when we say these words, we're not just making stuff up. I mean, we're not, you know, just, that it here, this is where it comes from. And, and what does it, what does it mean to hear those words week in and week out? What is the effect of, of calling upon that, that Trinitarian reality and Trinitarian essence of God that is then summarized in grace and love and communion. And that that's the way we begin our time together, that we begin our time together in worship with, with grace and love and communion. And that that sets apart uh, at, as, dis, as the distinctiveness of the Christian community. And so that, that I think would be another, again, another homiletical thing one could do. It's a great conclusion to the letter and, and something else preachers might want to point out. Like you said, we haven't made this stuff up. There's, you know, how, what is this speaking into? With both Matthew and with Second Corinthians, you've got the very end of, of documents here. You've got the final word of Jesus to his followers in, in Matthew's gospel. And then in Second Corinthians, you've got um, what appears to be Paul's final words, at least the ones that we have, to a community that really is sick and tired of him and doesn't seem to trust him and doesn't seem to like each other, you know? And so this kind of, of final blessing or this kind of last word or what sums up the argument or what sums up the mission, so to speak, in both is a blessing of the way in which, again, they represent who God is. They experience the benefits of God uh, in their in their common life is... Um, well, it's a challenge. It gets to the question of who are we as a people made in the image of God, crowned in glory and honor, but also then what are we to do? And what does it mean to bear the name of God, this, this triune name of God in the world in ways that actually then <laughs> reflect God's holiness uh, to the world as opposed to dragging it through the mud? So there's a kind of an interesting way in which we might talk about this language as empowering, not as a kind of wish that we hope is fulfilled, but as in a way of saying, uh, you know who you are and you know whose you are. And, and so then what does that look like for who you're going to be going forward? I think if I, think if I were preaching now, that would be what I would do. I, taking what Caroline said and, and as you just um, uh, elaborated on it, Matt, the end, of these words of Jesus from Matthew and these words of Paul to Corinth is where we begin liturgically. And we do that out of knowing who we are, bearing the image of the triune God.